Good day to all, and thank you for joining our launch of the little book of investing in nature in connection with the One Planet Summit in Paris. This event, which will uh, keep us together for the coming hour and a half with exciting topics and intervention on biodiversity finance and new updates with global figures. Um, and, and its title is nothing less than Financing Life on Earth. It is a discussion with some of the lead authors of the book and other experts on biodiversity finance. Before we start, a few words of thanks to the funders of the little book of biodiversity, uh, of investing in nature, sorry, or the ELBIN as we call it. Thank you to the Corner Atkinson Center for Sustainability, to Credit Suisse, to the Sustainable Trade Initiative, to Mirova, to Biofin, uh, of UNDP to WWF to uh, AFD, the French Development Agency. They all supported this publication and the work to prepare it. And a big thank as well, obviously, to the coordinators and initiators, Andrew Mitchell and Professor John Tobin, with us today for our greatest pleasure. Some few housekeeping rules. Uh, before uh, we, we go on, most of you are familiar with uh, Livestorm. Uh, if you have any suggestions, ideas, please share them in the chat tab on the right. If you have questions, do raise them through the question tab. And please note, any one of you can vote for the questions that you like. This will help us to select the questions that you find more interesting and pass them on to the moderators. We will also have uh, one question to you in the poll sondage tab, also on your right. Do check that in time. And uh, I inform you that the meeting will be recorded for the purpose of note taking and for sharing it beyond the participants today. So again, welcome to all. Uh, we are actually so many today to have joined this conference, almost 500, and, uh, and uh, almost uh, 1,300 have actually registered. So let me now introduce our first speaker, and a very warm welcome to Rémi Rioux, the CEO of the French Development Bank, AFD, who has been a great friend and actor of climate finance, before and during the Paris Agreement and since then, and who is now really blossoming as a great voice for biodiversity finance, especially among the community of public development banks. Please, Remy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gilles, and uh, hello, hello everybody. It's a, it's a great uh, pleasure. It's an honor to uh, to be with you and welcome you to this uh, discussion on uh, uh, the new edition of the little book of in, uh, investing in, uh, in 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 nature. Um, I participated uh, on uh, Monday at the One Planet Summit. Uh, at Elysee, uh, dedicated to um, biodiversity uh, challenges, and uh, um, the new um, the new handbook just arrived uh, during uh, lunch, uh, and so I had the, the chance and the opportunity uh, to explain uh, its um, content, uh, the, the, the conclusions, the proposals to. Uh, uh, President Macron, President Gazawi of um, Mauritania, uh, President uh, Christine Lagarde from ECB, uh, and uh, other um, excellencies uh, that were present uh, in Paris um, before the, the summit itself, uh, where uh, the discussion on uh, biodiversity uh, finance, uh, as uh, probably uh, you noticed, 
uh, was um, presented. Uh, Boris Johnson was there, many, many others uh, um, taking commitments uh, behind this, uh, this uh, fight of the century, as President Macron uh, said. Of course, I presented it, but uh, it was uh, on behalf uh, of um, many, many partners uh, as a very strong uh, uh, collective um, effort. And I, I really would like to thank today uh, all those who have supported uh, and contributed uh, to this uh, journey. Um, a journey, yes, because uh, uh, the Little Pink Book was, uh, you know, first published uh, 10 years ago uh, at COP10. Um, and the new, uh, the new edition uh, relies also on all the, the experience, the substance that so many partners have uh, accumulated uh, for uh, 10 years uh, on, this, uh, on this issue, all uh, uh, rallying behind the global canopy uh, in this uh, indispensable awareness raising uh, uh, effort. And now we have... Uh, uh, quite a large uh, circle of uh, stakeholders. Um, of course, um, I commend the role of uh, Pro Professor John uh, Tobin de la Puente from Cornell University, uh, Marisa Drew, uh, the Chief uh, Sustainability Officer and Global Head Sustainability Strategy of Credit Suisse, uh, Daniela Torres uh, from uh, UNDP uh, Biofin, uh, lead expert for Mexico, Fiona Fiona Stewart from the World, World Bank Group, Philippe Zawati, dear Philippe from Mirova, Gilles, uh, all of them uh, will um, be present uh, today. And I also mention, of course, the crucial role uh, of uh, Andrew Mitchell, uh, the founder and senior advisor of Global uh, Canopy and, and the whole uh, IDH uh, team uh, with WWF and, and all of you participants today uh, joining. Maybe a few words on the, the content of the handbook from uh, my perspective. Uh, a unique work because, uh, uh, as you know, it's uh, the only uh, estimate of uh, the um, funding gap uh, um, for uh, biodiversity. Uh, we know, reading uh, the text, that we are at about 100, 150 uh, uh, billion dollars uh, today, and that uh, we need to increase uh, tenfold uh, this amount uh, to be uh, at scale by 2030 to face uh, the challenges of uh, conservation, of course, but also. Uh, of the transformation of uh, value chains, the way we produce and uh, we consume. And the handbook is not only about uh, estimating uh, the financial needs, which is very important uh, in itself. Remember what we did uh, for COP21 on climate. Uh, it's, so it's extremely important to put these figures into the preparation of COP15. But it's way more than that, because the, the handbook also provides uh, the plan uh, to make it uh, happen and make it uh, possible. Um, four elements. The first one is um, there must be um, a public signal uh, given to the parties uh, by uh, reorienting public subsidies towards a uh, nature-based uh, solution, uh, carbon sequ sequestering habitats, agroforestry, agroecology, and reducing uh, harmful, uh, harmful subsidies. Uh, um, so the money is already there. Uh, it's only political will that could help uh, reorient these flows. Uh, then, of course, a lot to do um, through TNFD and other incentives to increase private uh, investments for nature. Um, the handbook uh, clearly uh, established that 80% uh, of all flows are now public, uh, which is important, but uh, way too much uh, in a way. Uh, so these uh, public means have to be uh, to help uh, demultiply and leverage uh, the private sector 
uh, way more than uh, today. And the third uh, direction is, of course, to turn south, uh, because most of the uh, biodiversity finance um, now happens in uh, OECD countries. And we know that uh, uh, the richness of biodiversity um, is uh, mostly uh, in uh, developing and uh, emerging uh, uh, countries. Uh, and of course, I would plea uh, um, so to um, um, to change the way public is operating, to leverage the private sector, and to turn south. Um, I, I will plea today on um, about the role, uh, the crucial role of public development banks. Uh, you know, we organized last November the Finance in Common Summit, uh, gathering for for the first time ever. Um, the whole uh, family of public development banks, uh, multilateral, uh, regional, national, uh, local, uh, 450 um, of us, uh, uh, amounting to 10%, 2.3 trillion of uh, total uh, global investments uh, each year. Uh, and of course, if these uh, public instruments follow the political guidance and act as uh, connectors, uh, as um, linking uh, public and private, linking global and local for nature, it will uh, certainly make uh, a difference. Um, a group of uh, public development banks, the DIDFC club I'm chairing, uh, uh, took a very strong position on biodiversity at the time of the, the finance in common uh, Summit, there's also a strong paragraph in the joint declaration of all of us that was uh, decided then. And let me uh, conclude uh, by saying, um, as the CEO of uh, Agence Française de Développement of AFD, uh, to share with you my conviction that uh, we uh, we need uh, to um, uh, to link. Uh, climate finance and biodiversity uh, finance um, and uh, avoid uh, a competition between uh, two uh, targets, two uh, um, negotiations, uh, two um, worlds, be because we all know in this room uh, that the two challenges are intertwined and that we will uh, fight uh, climate change uh, with uh, nature-based uh, solutions. This is the reason why uh, on Monday at the One Planet Summit, uh, AFD um, on behalf of France committed uh, that 30% uh, of its climate finance uh, will be uh, positive for nature uh, by 2025. Uh, it means uh, doubling our biodiversity finance from five 100 million euro today to uh, more than 1 billion uh, five years from uh, from now and of course uh, as i said we we need way more financing but we we hope uh, from afd to uh, put in the discussion and to provide some sort of uh, reference for other financial actors uh, to pay attention and see how far they can go in uh, increasing uh, their investments for nature and linking, because we know that the momentum, the political force uh, uh, will um, only increase behind climate to embark uh, biodiversity uh, in um, this fight. So I stop here. Uh, thank you again to all of you. Uh, to be here and AFD, of course, is a, a French agency, so um, very important to listen to um, Ms. Berenger Abba, the French Secretary of State for Biodiversity, who will uh, tell you now more about uh, my own country, France, commitment uh, to uh, preserving uh, uh, biodiversity. So thanks again uh, to uh, the team for this book. Thanks for this uh, webinar uh, and for the vibrant uh, discussion I'm sure uh, will uh, take place now. And uh, Gilles, uh, if okay for you, I turn to, uh, to our minister for her introduction. Thanks to you all.
Dear Hall, first, I would like to wish you a happy new year for you and your loved ones, even in these complicated and challenging times for everyone. The COVID-19 pandemic reminds us that human health and well-being, biodiversity loss and climate change are fully interwined. It is therefore of our utmost responsibility to tackle this planetary environmental emergency in an integrated way and make the transformative change need leaving no one behind. The good news is that 2021 will be the opportunity to reach an ambitious agreement at the next biodiversity COP15 and address the issue of financing the preservation and mainstreaming of biodiversity. The publication of the little book of investing in nature is therefore timely. It provides us with new insight on the biodiversity funding gap that for the first time takes into account funding dedicated to conservation and funding for biodiversity mainstreaming in whole economic sectors. Better yet, it gives us solutions. As you know, biodiversity is very high on the agenda for France. President Macron, who has been fully involved in boosting green and sustainable development and recovery, closed on Monday the first One Planet Summit dedicated to biodiversity. Important commitments were made on resource mobilization to create a movement toward a greener economy and greener finance. Through the Task Force on Natural-Related Financial Disclosures, whose ultimate objective is to trigger a massive redirection of flows towards activities that are favorable to biodiversity. At domestic level, France is already on track to amend its legislation to include biodiversity risk in the mandatory reporting standard for financial institutions. France is also fully committed to reform financial contributions harmful to biodiversity, notably through its involvement in the Paris Collaborative on Green Budgeting, initiated by France, Mexico and the OECD on the One Planet Summit in 2017. The EUCN Congress, to be held in September 2021 in Marseille, will be another great opportunity before COP15 to enhance the private sector's mobilization, and more particularly the financial sector, and to help make 2021 a decisive year for the worldwide protection of biodiversity. We really hope this book will help all stakeholders from governments, banks and NGOs to drive transformation and support an ambitious post-2020 agreement at COP15. Thank you. Thank you, Remy. Thank you to our uh, State Secretary for Biodiversity, Béranger Abba, here in Paris, for your insight and encouraging and supporting uh, words. Uh, and thank you again for AFD to virtually host this event 10 years after the first publication of the little uh, book on, on biodiversity finance in, in Nagoya. I will uh, now give the floor uh, to Andrew Mitchell, founder and senior advisor at Global Canopy and for the Natural Capital Finance Alliance. I'm so glad really again to share this moment with you 10 years almost exactly after I discovered the, with great enthusiasm the first edition of the, of the Elbin in Nagoya in 2010, which was such a, a hit uh, at the CBD Cup 10. Please, Andrew, do take over. The floor is yours. Well, Gilles, thank you very much. And thank you to Remy and also to Secretary of State uh, Berenger Abba for their uh, marvelous opening remarks. Um, and uh, we are tackling a big topic today. And I want to send out a great welcome to so many people who have joined from all over the world. People I could see from Africa, from Southeast Asia, Jakarta, uh, and of course from Europe and the United States. So welcome to everyone. Uh, this is the 10th anniversary of the first little book, which was colored pink, because it was about proactive investment in natural capital, which in those days was rather a new idea. Uh, you may recall all the negotiations going on about red, which was reducing emissions from deforestation and so on, and landscapes. Well, the next thing was to go to pink, which was to look at all the agricultural landscapes beyond the forest, which needed protection as well. Well, a lot's changed in 10 years. We're all now living under lockdown, and it's all caused by a tiny speck of nature that we cannot see. The COVID-19 pandemic has done a lot to explain to the world, to all of us, to governments and to the financial sector, the power of nature to turn our economy upside down and all our lives as well. My hearts go out to all those who, who are suffering around the world. 
But this is an example of what happens when we mess with nature, when we don't look after what is underpinning 44 trillion of our global economy. That's almost half of GDP that is dependent on services from nature. And when we degrade nature, when we engage in illegal trade in wildlife, and when we mix it all together with strange food production, we get zoonotic diseases coming out like COVID-19, transferring from animals uh, to humans. This shows that the impact of nature on our economic system is not slow, it's not small. In fact, it's big and hits many sectors and it can be very fast. It's bigger than anything climate has thrown to at us. So what we've got to do is figure out how we change the movement of money. Fundamentally, I mean, I used to uh, start out my life as a zoologist 40 years ago, hugging orangutans and trees. I realized I couldn't save them that way. And now I find myself hugging bankers and asset managers because unless we change the movement of money, fundamentally, we will continue to finance ourselves into extinction. So what we're going to go and look at today and what this 10th anniversary edition of the little book is, is looking at a menu of different kinds of mechanisms that can change the movement of money, incentivize investment, case studies of where this is actually working around the world. I kind of call it a hitchhiker's guide to financing life on Earth. So it's a good thing to dip into, particularly this year, when the meeting in Kunming will try and come together, bring the world together, bring all the governments together, 200 of them, to come up with a new sort of Paris-style agreement on nature with targets and dates. And we wish them luck in doing that. But how is it all going to be paid for? That's what we need uh, to get into. And uh, to show you how important all this is, there's a short video that I'm going to show you now that sort of sets up our discussion. So Delphine, would you please play the video now? Well, I think that makes it very clear what we're really talking about. And I want to thank UNDP for loaning that, uh, that video for us, which was first shown at the Green Horizon Summit last year. Uh, well, it's time now for you to do a bit of work. You, the audience, we're going to have a poll. And I want to find out what you're thinking. And these questions that are here are deliberately not that easy. They're not the usual easy kind of questions that you might get in a webinar like this, because we're in a deep dive webinar here. We're getting down to the real detail. I want you now to vote. And if you go to the polls section, look at the top right of your screen, it's got a little red dot on it. And if you go there, you can vote on the five questions that you're seeing on your screen. So please do that now. And within 90 seconds, we should have the results. So don't spend too long on it. Go with what your heart tells you and uh, make your choice. So the first is about relying in taxes to favor sustainable diets. It's kind of strange, isn't it, that good food is often more expensive than bad food. Cheap food that may be not good for our health and not good for nature. It's cheap for a reason. It's not prepared as well as high quality food. Should we have lower taxes for good food like organic food or vegan food? What about outlawing the destruction of nature and supply chains. Well, do you know what? It's already happening. Uh, this week at the One Planet Summit, uh, the uh, president of the European Commission announced that Europe was going to have a new deforestation regulation, making it harder for imports coming into Europe 
uh, that are connected to deforestation to get into European uh, uh, into the European supply chain. Subsidies, a huge problem. A trillion of subsidies are nature negative. What can we do to change those? We don't want to get rid of them, but realign them to make them nature positive. Mandating reporting on risks by the finance sector. Again, back to the banks, insurers, investors. Shouldn't they be reporting on how they're damaging nature in the same way that they now have to report on how they're damaging our climate and the atmosphere? That's coming too. And the fifth one, the last one, what about banning international finance for unsustainable intensive agriculture? Not sure how we'd do it, but would it be, in other words, starving the bad businesses of money? And then how do you define what's good or bad? So uh, I don't know, Delphine, if we are ready, if we've got our 90 seconds up, a few more seconds for everyone to think. And then Delphine, when you're ready, uh, you can put up the poll results. So Delphine, can you put up the results? Uh, it should come in under the polls uh, section, I think. Well, I don't see the results there yet. And I, rather than wait, I think we might move on and uh, they will come shortly. And when they're ready, uh, we might see a little red dot up there and uh, we can go back to the polls. Uh, and see if it's there. So I think we're going to press on as time is quite short. So uh, <clears throat> what we're now going to turn to is uh, a description of what's in the book. And to do this, the lead editor for the book, Professor John Tobin at Cornell University, who has been working diligently with me over the last 18 months with many different authors and a steering committee, and in particular, a wonderful team of his uh, at, uh, at Cornell University. And a shout out for Al and Al Majid, who also did so much work on this, if they're listening. So John, you have the floor. Tell us what's in the book. Well, thank you, Andrew. Thanks for the introduction. And thank you all to attending this presentation. Um, I just want to make sure that we have the slides up as well. And I think we are awaiting those, but they should be in front of us shortly. Voila, okay, thank you. Uh, excellent. Well, summarizing one, one and a half years of work, and uh, into 10 minutes, as you can imagine, is a bit of a challenge. But let me just try to uh, touch on some of the highlights of the book, uh, where we're coming from and where we think we may, may be heading uh, from here. Uh, and ideally, whet your appetite and make you want to uh, download the book and take a more careful look at it. So how did we approach this in the first place? Uh, we started by asking a very simple question. How much are we spending today on nature? And if we decided as a community of nations that we uh, want to maintain biodiversity sustainably managed for the long term, how much should we be spending in order to accomplish that? Once we have uh, figured that out, uh, the immediate natural next question is how do we close the biodiversity finance gap if there is a delta if there is indeed a difference between uh what we spend and what we need to be spending to protect nature what are the solutions and the mechanisms that we can apply to close that and then third and finally how can public capital and private capital collaborate work together uh, side by side to help preserve biodiversity. Uh, the reality is, and I may be jumping ahead a little bit uh, here, but governmental budgets and philanthropic organizations will simply not be enough to close the biodiversity financing gap. Uh, so making 
private, return-seeking capital a part of the solution to the biodiversity crisis, rather than being part of the problem, which unfortunately much of finance has been up until now, uh, will be difficult and will require more effort and more focus than many recognize. But the potential impacts are huge. Now, in terms of how we organize some of the information, uh, we applied the UNDP Biofin framework. It's a four-part framework that many of you, uh, particularly those of you who have, who have worked on uh, um, national finance plans, national biodiversity finance plans, will be quite familiar with. And uh, it consists of four uh, uh, pillars, the generation of revenue, the delivery of that revenue once it has been generated, the realignment of expenditures. So for existing capital, how can it be spent in a manner that is more nature positive? And finally, crucially, one part that doesn't get a lot of attention uh, is how do we avoid future costs or foregone revenues that we could be earning in the future if we uh, 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 make certain interventions today that prevent uh, having to incur those costs in the future. Now, we have slightly modified this uh, UNDP Biofin framework uh, with an additional element which we consider critical, especially given the moment, and that is catalysts. And catalysts are crucially important because uh, the crisis is real and it is immediate and there is no time to waste. If we allowed the uh, sustainable finance ecosystem, if you will, the uh, natural capital system to develop organically from within, uh, it will eventually develop. The question is, will it develop in time to prevent massive loss of biodiversity? And the answer is probably not. So in order to facilitate the application of these uh, four different categories of mechanisms or solutions, catalysts that facilitate them will be crucially important. More on that in the book. Um, in terms of the current scale of finance, I should mention that, long story short, a lot of work, much of it uh, done in collaboration with uh, our friends at the Nature Conservancy, uh, with uh, some involvement of the uh, Paulson Institute as well, uh, and uh, building on the shoulders of, of giants, really. OECD, for example, has done tremendous work in this space. Uh, uh, National Geographic, more recently, has done some great work. And the estimate that we can have come up with for uh, spending on nature is in the order of 124 to 143 billion dollars per year, which is a lot of money. But how does that compare to biodiversity financing needs? And the reality is that it is very different. We should be, if we want to manage biodiversity for the long term, somewhere in the order of 720 to 960 billion dollars per year. So that delta, that difference, is this biodiversity finance gap that needs to be closed. Uh, how do we close it? How do we close that gap? I want to draw attention to uh, a crucially important fact, which has already been highlighted in the poll, and that is negative subsidies are a real problem for nature. And uh, I want to emphasize that it's not subsidies themselves, because uh, uh, subsidies by nature uh, uh, or by definition are neither positive nor negative for nature. It all depends on how they are implemented. And the fact is many of our subsidies policies, which national governments uh, 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 implement, and in many cases for uh, very understandable uh, political or cultural or social reasons, uh, have been designed to achieve just that, to support groups in need, 
but not necessarily to support biodiversity. And it is the shift to a different way of implementing subsidies, which will be crucial because as you see in this graph, even under the most optimistic growth assumptions of uh, uh, the most important mechanisms or the most promising mechanisms for raising capital, and that is the middle column. If you look at uh, um, the uh, teal colored rectangles, that will still not be enough to get us to a break-even point unless we reduce subsidies. However, if we do reduce subsidies, and again, biodiversity negative subsidies to be clear, then uh, we can actually not only break even, but do very well. Um, we cover in the order of 40 mechanisms or solutions in some detail in the book. Uh, and I invite you to go uh, read them yourselves. Uh, all of them aligned with the Biofin framework. And we have a number of case studies that illustrate the challenges and the uh, 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 points that you should keep in mind when implementing those solutions. None of them easy, but some of them very, very effective. Uh, I'll just mention by way of example, a couple in the area of generation. Uh, green bonds, a form of financing that almost everyone on this call will be familiar with. But you will also know that most green bonds out there uh, have been designed in a manner or uh, uh, pitched to investors in a manner that is clear that the use of proceeds is for uh, energy efficiency projects, uh, 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 green buildings, public transportation, relatively few uh, are addressing nature conservation directly. But one great example is uh, the Green Republic of France bond of 2017, started at 7.6 billion and has grown from there. Another example, realignment of harmful subsidies. And I mentioned in passing here, the fact that the Kyrgyzstan government working with UNDP Biofin has already gone quite some way towards reforming uh, their own ag subsidies uh, in order to reduce agrochemicals that can be harmful to biodiversity and excessive water use. Um, the next one I should mention is uh, the example of private protected areas uh, as an example of delivering existing capital better. Uh, private protected areas may serve a, a tremendously helpful functioning in complementing uh, what has been done by governments uh, and uh, establishing additional protected areas that would not be there uh, uh, but for the, the efforts of private parties. Finally, I'd like to mention environmental impact bonds, which are a new form of instrument that um, it has huge promise. There are some difficulties, but systems in which the political realities do not allow the implementation of novel solutions to biodiversity conservation. Um, could, can greatly benefit from risk capital that is willing to come into the uh, 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 transaction on a conditional basis, subject to the outcomes of the novel solutions or interventions that are being proposed. There are some great examples out there that are now in pilot phase or some uh, fully launched uh, for the Forest Resilience Bond of uh, um, Blue Forest Conservation is one example. There are the uh, urban water bonds of uh, quantified ventures uh, and um, uh, others that you may be aware of are in development. Finally, and to wrap up, I would like to draw attention to a fact that uh, we view as crucial to um, uh, developing conservation and biodiversity financing 
uh, with the support of an active participation of private capital uh, as a solution. And that is, um, individual solutions, individual transactions, individual initiatives amount to exactly that. Helpful pilots that illustrate the uh, viability or not of a particular kind of transaction or initiative or project or arrangement, but uh, they tend to pop up. Uh, some are successful, some are not, and then they disappear. But if you think of uh, this new space that we're moving into, biodiversity finance, as a, uh, a, a newly colonized island, to take the ecosystem analogy uh, one step further, uh, uh, the individual of arrival of a bird or a few seeds of a plant is not enough. For a living, breathing ecosystem to develop on that new island, there needs to be a simultaneous uh, a, 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 a coexistence of any number of different species that have different roles in ecological parlance that fill different niches within that ecosystem. And in the case of uh, a, a, a financial ecosystem for nature, we need to have, as we have seen develop in other uh, um, systems, uh, the, all of those support pro, uh, and uh, service providers and uh, the, oh, the banks and the useful uh, and uh, uh, um, sort of more conducive regulatory framework that supports the development of this field. In other words, it's not through uh, individual efforts that we are going to make a difference, at least not a difference quickly. Given the urgency of the situation, we need to do this uh, in a coordinated manner. And that's why a catalyst such as government support of the development of this financial ecosystem uh, is crucial. Uh, on the right of that slide in front of you, you will see uh, some of the transformations that will be needed and uh, in order to develop that ecosystem. And with that, I will go back to Andrew. And um, there's certainly no time for Q&A, but I believe we'll be addressing some questions later. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, John, for a very interesting run through of the contents of this book. It's a rich garden, so uh, you need to know where to find it. And uh, one place you can find this book is uh, if you go to the website of Global Canopy. Just type in to your search engine, globalcanopy.org, and there it is on the front page, a little book of investing in nature. You can find it there, and maybe uh, someone listening can put that into the chat, that web where you can find the book. So many thanks, John. Uh, a difficult job going through so many wonderful pieces of work uh, that were, uh, went, into, com uh, went into compiling that book. Um, I thought you'd like to know the results of the poll. If you've had a look at the chat, they're in the chat. If you scroll down to Agence Française, you will find it a few pages down. But actually, the results are pretty interesting. <clears throat> first of all, uh, the, the first and winner and the most popular thing was to uh, rearrange subsidies to be nature positive rather than nature negative. That at 33% was way out in front as being the most important thing. Second in that came with banning finance for intensive agriculture. Well, that'd be pretty radical, wouldn't it? Uh, and uh, uh, after that uh, comes the supply chains, dealing with supply chains that are nature negative. That's, of course, allied to uh, in, uh, uh, intensive agriculture. 18% of you thought that was the most important thing. Uh, and then uh, fourth and fifth, which are pretty close to each other, was reporting uh, by the financial sector on its impacts on nature and also realigning taxes to favor uh, sustainable foods. So uh, very interesting results. I, maybe it's worth putting them up again in the chat as we've just highlighted it for those who didn't see it earlier. But thank you so much for taking part in that. We're now going to go on to the panel section of our event. And I'm going to introduce the uh, very, very exciting and interesting panel that we've got for you. Uh, so panelists, would you like to please join? Here they are, if you'd like to join the screen whilst I'm talking. Over there on the left is Daniela Torres. 
Daniela is currently working at UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, as lead expert on Biodiversity Finance Initiative in Mexico. But prior to that, she was working with Mexico's central bank. So we're going to ask Daniela to tell us a bit what a, a bank regulator can do, because they are, after all, the high priests of the financial system, creating the rules that makes money move around the world. Marissa Drew is Chief Sustainability Officer at uh, Credit Suisse, a bank in Switzerland. And Credit Suisse has done a tremendous amount of work in this area through the uh, regular, every January, they have a, a regular conference on conservation finance, bringing the experts of the world together, usually in New York. But this year, it's going to be virtual uh, next week. And uh, Melissa is also involved in the strategy and ambition for Credit Suisse and for creating and facilitating sustainable investments on behalf of the bank's wealth management, institutional and corporate clients. Next, we have Fiona Stewart, who's global lead on insurance and pensions at the World Bank Group. And she's a, a lead financial sector specialist, is part of the long-term finance team at the World Bank's finance competitiveness and innovation global practice. And she's worked a lot on sustainability issues. And then finally, uh, we have Philippe Zawati, who's the CEO of Mirova. Philippe is Managing Director of Morova, which is an asset management company specializing in sustainable investment. And he created this with Natixis at 2014. But Philippe has been a leading light in Paris in the biodiversity and finance movement. And we're extremely lucky to have him and all the other panelists to talk to us today. So welcome to you all. Uh, let me just outline a few things that I, I, I want us to get into on this uh, in this moment uh, that we have in front of us. We talk about creating a financial ecosystem for nature. In climate, uh, it's taken 15 years, but there is already an emerging kind of ecosystem. One of the big advantages of the climate debate is it has a target. This was decided in Paris. It's 1.5 degrees. It also has a currency. It's called one ton of carbon. The problem with nature is we don't have these. We don't have a unit of nature that we can trade like a ton of carbon, nor do we have targets. We hope they might come out in the COP15 in China later this year. We need a kind of Paris Agreement for nature. So there are big gaps there. We don't have good laws and regulations around nature as well, or if they are there, they're not always implemented. In many countries, there are laws, but they're not always implemented for nature. Uh, we have uh, problems in that money, which is flowing, doesn't is, is the, the impact on nature is invisible. If you look inside a Bloomberg terminal, which uh, is the way in which many, many transactions, at least in the Western world, are done, a huge amount of money is moved by looking at data inside service providers. Not much there on natural capital. The problem is nature is invisible in transactions. The costs of transactions are very high for investors and banks. When you're trying to do the right thing for nature, there are a lot of checks and balances that you have to put in place. That makes it expensive for these transactions, and they're not so profitable. So doing the right thing often costs more than doing the wrong thing. Well, that's a crazy world, isn't it? So let's get into some of these uh, topics. And I'm going to turn, first of all, to Fiona. Fiona, you work for a gigantic World Bank, nothing less. It's all there in the name. What do you think is the biggest thing that the World Bank do to try and help create this ecosystem for nature? Um, thanks, Andrew. Um, and first of all, can I say I love the book, by the way. So I'm going to be one of your main marketers. I think it's great. Um, I really like this, the, the structure and the, the, the data that's in there. So I'm a big, big fan of the little book already. Um, I think as the bank, as you say, we are a bank. Um, so I think one of the, the key things, obviously, is how we use the, the, cap the capital that we have most effectively. And I think this is particularly important for nature versus climate. Um, with climate, um, renewable energy, you need subsidies to, to make uh, that business model uh, competitive with, with fossil fuels, and then the subsidies can come out, it can go on its own. With nature, a lot of the, the, the projects and the areas, it may not be by its own, by its very nature, uh, commercially viable. So how you use com um, concessional finance, how we use uh, the public sector finance, I think is particularly important for this area. So, and I think to date, we haven't necessarily used the, the leverage that we can get from the blended finance model of public and private together as well as we could. I think that's, I think the bank, I think the book is, is honest about that. And I think that's right. 
So how we how we leverage better the use of, of the finance from, from the World Bank and other the MDBs, as, as Remy pointed out, is very important. Philippe, I actually really like the no Minerva fund model, for example, where you have anchor investors um, and then you, you structure like a, the, the, a, a project finance 101 with, with different tranches. I actually like the Minerva structure of your funds a lot. I think there's that sort of model, I think, can be very good. For, I think we're really getting more of the leverage up. So as we act as a bank and we act as a catalyst. Um, John mentioned the word catalyst. The catalytic funding is incredibly important. The other thing I will also pick up, um, again, it's come up again, in, in the poll is very interesting on the, on the subsidies. So the other thing we do at the bank, obviously, is in our own operations and our own lending to governments related to policy and using that as a catalyst and leverage for policy change. So um, I think we have a big role there to, to, to play a part in changing how these subsidies are structured in countries. And we've done some work with governments in Latin America, for example, around agricultural subsidies. But I think that policy catalytic work that we can use through our lending, but also acting as uh, anchor investors in private finance, I think is two very, very key roles of the bank and the other MDBs can play. Fiona, thank you very much for that, uh, those are opening remarks. Let me turn to Daniela. Um, we talked about subsidies. I don't know how big subsidies are in, in Mexico and whether you dealt with that at all in the regulatory work. Uh, but tell us what you think from Mexico's perspective and from the perspective of a regulator that you worked with, what they can do uh, to create this kind of ecosystem for finance for nature. Thank you so much, Andrew, and good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for this invitation. It is a great pleasure to be part of, of this event. And also thank you, Andrew, for this question. I would like to start highlighting that governments, international leaders, institutions, and initiatives have recognized the importance of looking beyond carbon climate. And we are now working with nature and biodiversity, and it is a big step. Um, secondly, we have reconfirmed that the private and the financial sector have an important role to play, not only to finance actions related uh, to climate change and biodiversity, but also in understanding their dependencies and impacts on nature. And this decade is to act in consequence. Um, third point is that the ministries of finance, central banks, financial system regulators around the world are involved in these uh, discussions and are taking action now. So with this context, Biofin Mexico is working with the CMBB uh, to catalyze this positive financial ecosystem for nature. And the CMBB, uh, for all the, the participants, is a regulatory body that supervises and um, regulates financial entities here in Mexico. So the work with them uh, would have an effect in the whole financial system is the reason why we are working with them. And as part, of the, uh, as part of this collaboration, we have analyzed a big set of options and opportunities to generate a positive financial ecosystem through financial regulation. And I can mention some examples, Andrew, to answer your question. The first uh, one is that regulators can help to develop and provide metrics and methodologies to assess how financial entities impact biodiversity because actually they don't understand that. It's, very, it's a very new topic, so it is very important. Um, it can help businesses to become more nature friendly and decision makers could take uh, environmental is issues into account in their decisions. The second um, issue is the, the establishment of common definitions of what is biodiversity finance, what is a sustainable investment, or what would be recogni recognized as a green loan or green investment, for example, and adopt it at national level and, and use uh, these kind of terms um, in a common way. Uh, third, the regulation can also help uh, to harmonize the different methodologies that we have for providing ESG information and ratings and make it uh, mandatory, particularly in this context where the, there's, there's a growing interest, uh, interesting, sorry, in combining economic development with, with uh, sustainability. And finally, the regulation can incentivize and promote nature positive investments and lending opportunities and financial instruments to mobilize uh, bigger amounts for climate and biodiversity financing. And it is because a better understanding of nature, harmonization of criteria and methodologies allow to investors to measure the impact of their investments and provide them certainty and transparency. So, Having said that, uh, Biofin Mexico is working with the CMBB in these four points and some other actions for integrating biodiversity criteria in the regulatory system. 
And I have to say that the CMBB has established uh, sustainable finance within the regulatory agenda for the financial system here in Mexico, and it is a backbone of all these uh, actions taken. And in addition, uh, BIFIN is advising the CMBB in its role as a member of the TNFV, which, as you know, and you he uh, have heard during this One Planet Summit, is working on disclosure, tracking, and reporting of biodiversity finance and nature-related uh, risk. Mm. So uh, we are also, finally, in the resource mobilization side, we are sharing some experiences with the, common, uh, with the Commission and its members, such as the private banks, uh, regarding sustainable financial products uh, focused on conservation, which can have reasonable uh, risk return profiles and positive co benefits. So, Daniela, yeah, I need yeah. to move over to Marissa. It's quite sure. a long list there of uh, very, very interesting topics. Will you forgive me? And we'll come back to this in a second, but I need to get uh, in the interest of time. Just let me go across to, to Marissa. Sure. Because you, you've heard what a regulator is looking at in Mexico. I don't know if Credit Suisse does a lot of investing in Mexico, but you invest a lot elsewhere, Credit Suisse. So, you know, what's that? In, what, what's what's the what, what's the thing you think is important as a major international bank in this sector? And, and perhaps reflect a little bit on the regulatory side of this. Sure, sure, well, with pleasure. And and interestingly, Danielle and I are very much aligned, as as we are with Fiona's comments as well. Um, so the, the beautiful thing about operating in this space is I think we're, uh, in many cases, we cross in parallel circles, but we're all part of the same mission and in uh, the same belief system. But if I were to articulate it from the perspective of both a bank using its own lending capital and underwriting capital, but also speaking for the investment community, because every day we're investing with those uh, or interacting with those who have capital that want to deploy capital in these spaces. So first and foremost, picking up on what Daniela said is, a common set of metrics. But in my opinion, for biodiversity, this is where it gets a bit complicated, uh, we need a common set of metrics by industry that, that are really backed by high quality science. And, and in that respect, um, I think we need a simplicity of disclosure, and those metrics do have to be simple. So if we think about a loan that we might be providing to one of our companies, one of the reasons that that uh, the environment thus far has been effective in terms of its scaling on CO2 emissions is that's one single number that was globally market adopted as something to strive for. So if you're a company, you can measure your CO2 footprint and try to drive for reduction. Somewhat simple in concept, at least, maybe not in practice. But in, in, in the, in the um, fragile ecosystems, it is not clear that there is one thing to solve for if you are a corporate company trying to drive outcomes. And I think it's very much dependent on the industry. If you are say in agriculture, maybe nitrogen runoff is the second thing that you need to be measuring and driving for. So I think we need to come up with something simple by industry and we need to have that be then commonly adopted so that we can drive scale capital, drive lending capital that way. And I think the TNFD, the Task Force for Nature Financial Disclosure, is working very hard at trying to define what those metrics are. And then the whole financial community, as well as regulators and, and NGOs, can all kind of push in that direction. The second thing I think that we need is a supportive disclosure environment. So option one would be voluntary. And, and then you work with, you know, I would say peer pressure to push you into what is best practice. And I have to say that the investment community has an enormous weight and power. You as an investor can drive the outcomes that you want by putting pressure on companies in terms of who you invest in and what you want to see. But you can also do that in the form of being consumers for those companies. And organizations like PRI, Principles for Responsible Investment, or even SASB, who are today voluntary, but pushing in a common direction in terms of disclosure and what good looks like is important. And of course, then the option two is what Daniela referenced, which is mandatory. So having regulators come in and force the issue, because that would jumpstart mass adoption in the financial services industry, because if we have to do it, we don't have a choice but then to, to move forward. And TCFD, Task Force for Climate Financial Disclosure, which today is voluntary, is soon to become mandatory, and that's a very good example on the climate side that hopefully we can adopt through TNFD in due course. And the next thing I would just point to really quickly is just good proof points. We've got to have good case studies that demonstrate to the investment community that the returns are there. And why is ESG investment scaling right now? Because we have more and more proof points, particularly through the COVID crisis, of ESG and sustainable funds outperforming virtually almost, you know, uh, in totality, 
uh, versus their peer benchmarks. So if we can demonstrate those proof points, that gives confidence to the market and more capital will flow. And then uh, last thing would be just different types of investments that deal. There has to be a plethora of investment opportunities that can deal with the unique needs of different investors. So there's a pocket for illiquid venture, high risk, high return, but that's not where a lot of mainstream finance is, which is looking for more liquid solutions that they can trade in and out of. That's where a lot of scale capital is. And as the investment community, we need to respond to that to give investment opportunities across the piece. So in that respect, we're trying to give a visibility and voice and a platform for those who we think are doing it well. Andrew, thank you for mentioning the conservation conference. I'd like to extend an invitation to this audience. It is free to join. Um, and because we're virtual next year, uh, this year, uh, it'll be on the 21st of, of January at 2 p.m. British time, and we can make connections for those of you who are interested. But I call this a conference of doers, not talkers. Okay, um, let's get the link to that conference put in the chat. Can somebody find it who's listening and try and get it into the chat so people can find out how to join a very interesting perspective from Credit Suisse. Now, Philippe, you have been working at the front line of this for a long time where the rubber hits the road deploying private capital into some of the most risky environments as some people may see it in trying to turn around deforestation in natural capital but also in other areas in renewable energy and so on so um we're seeing massive rise in esg that's good but we also need case studies as marissa said of where investment can work so what's your perspective from working with mirova and delivering uh, a proof point that investment can really work in this area. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, uh, very nice to be to be here with you. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, on the climate side, uh, today we have a, a clear uh, understanding of the relationship between performance and uh, responsibility, I would say, and, uh, and investment in, in transition. Uh, everybody understands that uh, investing in renewable energy, clean mobility, innovation, and so on, uh, is a, a very strong opportunity uh, also in terms of financial performance. Uh, we have to prove uh, that it's the same for biodiversity and nature. Uh, and to explain that uh, biodiversity is to a certain extent a risk for, for, for companies and especially companies who are not taking, taking it uh, into account. But it's also, uh, it's also a, a, a very good opportunity for investment for private finance. And, uh, and it's exactly what we, what we are seeing. I mean, we have been building uh, the pipeline for uh, our funds uh, for the last five, six years. Uh, and we see more and more uh, very good projects and uh, are really uh, committed and ambitious entrepreneurs which are uh, creating new models, creating, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 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 developing new markets, uh, especially using technology or uh, gathering a lot of different uh, small uh, um, uh, farmers uh, without grabbing land and, uh, and just providing them with services and technology. So there are a lot of very good opportunities on the ground. So that's the first very important thing. Uh, but of course, we, we need to define uh, more precisely what does it mean. I mean, what does capital, uh, investing in natural capital means? We, uh, we, we should have a clearer vision, I, I think, of all the possible investment strategies that needs to be uh, developed on, on, on this space. And this is uh, the, the reason why we, uh, we, we think that we have to, to work with uh, uh, the couple of uh, uh, new players in, uh, in, in this uh, area. And uh, this is uh, why we have uh, uh, decided to work with other partners under the ages of Prince Charles to improve uh, this narrative for institutional investors, and especially with uh, HSBC and, and Lombardia, what we announced uh, on, on Monday. Uh, you, you mentioned renewable energies. Uh, that's, that's a good point, I mean, uh, uh, because we, we can make uh, and find the similar, similarities between what we have done in, in renewable energy and what we do in, in, in natural capital. As for renewable energies, we need to uh, uh, I mean, accompany the transition from the niche, which was the case 15 years ago for renewable energy, to the mainstream. Uh, and, and for this, we had, for renewable energy, the help of a, a structure like feed-in tariffs. Uh, for biodiversity, we may also have some uh, similar mechanism like carbon credits, carbon credits or biodiversity credits. But on the top of this, uh, clearly, uh, the most important thing maybe today is blended finance. It's very, very important, and you mentioned it. And, uh, and Remy, you said uh, in, the, in his uh, introduction that 
80% of the investments today were coming from, uh, from the public side. So we need to change this. Uh, but blended fin finance has today a track record, uh, but uh, it's clearly way uh, far from, from what we, we, we can do. Uh, we, we need to, to, to build now uh, much more uh, trust and reliability between the public side and the private side. So from the private side that needs more reliability in terms of uh, the use of uh, ENS, uh, environmental and social criteria, on the uh, from the public side, that means, I mean, uh, quick, uh, more, I mean, quicker decision, uh, more efficiency, uh, and more trust that the, the private sector can uh, also bring a lot of, of, of value uh, of value in it. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think we, uh, we, of course, need to, to protect ourselves from, uh, from, from greenwashing, and we, uh, we, we, we need to, to, to put a lot of integrity in, uh, in this area with uh, also uh, indicators. And, uh, uh, and more reliable measurement tools. And this is the reason why also we launched uh, uh, last year uh, this consortium with uh, other players like BNP Paribas, AXA, and Sycomore in order to create an investment data uh, the database uh, of, um, um, I mean, the impact of, of corporates on nature and, uh, and biodiversity. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, it will be also something that uh, we uh, will go out from the, the, the TNFD work. Thank you, uh, Philippe. Let me just open out our discussion. A lot of points uh, uh, kicking around here. We've also had a few questions coming in, and I just want to uh, pick up on one of those questions. Uh, 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 one of the questions that's been posed is, how come all the financiers, they only seem interested in financing really big projects? What about small projects? Uh, I don't know how you define big and small. I, I hear the reverse sometimes. Uh, if you, a big project, if you're a pension fund, is a billion dollars. And they're not enough of those around. They want billion dollar projects. If you're working in an impact investor, it might be 20 million, 50 million. But if you're a poor family working on the front line, it might be uh, as little as a few hundred dollars to $10,000. So how do we deal with that spectrum? Fiona, would you, you must have some experience with this with the bank. And then Marissa, you might have a comment on that. Fiona. Yeah, so certainly I think these, um, putting together these fund structures, I think is very important. So the more that you can aggregate um, aggregate projects um, uh, is, is absolutely key. Um, that's the way you will be able to mainstream, as you know, Marissa, as you're saying, then to get into the, the broad investor, um, the, the scalable group. It's got to be that. And that's what the, 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 P, we need, what the P markets, et cetera, that have, that have learned from this. So we have the structures there. I think it's much more about, about combining um, whether it's thematically or whether it's regionally, but we have to have more of these um, fund structures that, as Philippe says, use the blended finance better to really to, to start to get into the scale of this. So I think it's it's through fund structures. Yeah, we might come back to blended finance. Marissa, uh, what is your experience? Sure, and, and, and I agree with Fiona that, um, so for as an investor, you can either invest in a single entity, a company, a technology, and I think that's probably what our, our reader or listener was referring to is it's very hard to get funding for some of these earlier stage um, investments. And I think they were referencing in particular things in the ocean uh, conservation space. But what we're seeing emerge is that um, many investors who have a high risk tolerance, they'd like to spread it out over many investments. So this is classic venture capital theory that you need to have a portfolio of say 20 to 50 investments and a few will hit it big, uh, a vast majority will be middling and a whole lot will fail. But as an investor, if you can have a portfolio, you buy down your risk. And I think um, we're seeing very directed funds emerge that are focused very specifically on biodiversity type topics. As an example, there's an organization that just invests in venture stage blue tech. Uh, called See Ahead, not to shout out any one particular organization, but just to illustrate that that is a very, very specific way of thinking about venture in a subset of the overall biodiverse space. So I think that's one avenue. And then the second avenue is in the fund construct, somebody else uh, sort of asked the question of, does it always have to be about returns, financial returns and commercial returns? The answer is in conservation, this is why it is difficult, is that oftentimes the classic commercial returns aren't there. Uh, because we haven't been able to figure out a way in a systematic fashion of pricing uh, the cost of inaction or the pricing the cost of, of the behaviors that we're deploying. But that's where we can partner with concessionary finance providers. It could be folks like uh, the development funding banks, but it could also be philanthropists. 
in those same structures to take risk off the tables, it could be governments. We had everybody um, saying that they like this concept of subsidies. We often think of subsidies as a specific incentive, but a subsidy can be also in the form of taking risk off the table to, to enhance returns for commercial investors. Very good example of something like that would be the solar industry. Philippe talked about um, alternative energy. Um, through tax equity incentives that were provided back in the day by the U.S. government, that absolutely started the entire solar industry to make it one of the um, highest employers in, in the United States through the mechanism of tax incentives to try to jumpstart something that was otherwise at the time not necessarily fully commercial for the consumer. So I think there are lots and lots of mechanisms if we put our financial innovation brains on. Well, indeed, and you can find uh, nearly oh, more than 40 mechanisms in the book if you go through them, and there's lots of other case studies as well. So I want to come to Daniela again. Uh, Daniela, we had an interesting question from Brian Sobel. How do we make sure financing is going to benefit marginalized populations? Now, I know that, you know, in, in Mexico, many Latin American countries, there are people struggling uh, on the line there. Uh, maybe you can comment on that. But first, let me ask you uh, about your favorite case study. You work in Biofin. You collected them from all over the world. Uh, do you have a favorite? Yes, Andrew, thank you so much. And I have some uh, favorite cases, but I choose one that is related with Bifin Mexico's work and is, uh, is just scaring out in, this, in these months. So Mexico shares the same challenges that the people is mentioned here and with the rest of the world, especially in the LAC region where public resources for biodiversity are permanently decreasing, but the size of the investments, risk, uh, uh, et cetera, limits the private and financial sector involvement. So we are working on unlocking resource mobilization for these, for these uh, sources. And let me show you how do we do that. At the end of the last year, Biofin Mexico uh, launched the first specialized bioeconomy acceleration fund, which is providing technical assistance and capacity building for those companies that promote economic activities using components of biodiversity as the main input of value creation. But that also has a, a net positive impact on livelihoods, communities, and ecosystem functionality under a competitive approach. And as a result of our first uh, call for proposals in September last year, the fund is supporting uh, coffee, honey, mezcal, and aquaculture companies. Our work with them is focused on developing new financial mechanisms for coffee industry, for example, and um, expanding sales channels and professionalizing business models, especially in the financial component. So these investment cases will allow to show and disseminate evidence that bioeconomy business models can be consolidated as bankable, profitable, and environmentally sustainable projects, and bridge them with the financial sector as well as multi multinational companies. So the expected results could be used by the private funds, family offices um, that have demonstrated interest uh, on conservation investments, but that are not ready to assume the risk associated with this, uh, with this new asset class. So I'm pretty sure that this will be my favorite business case in, <laughs> of investing in nature. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Daniela. Um, uh, we had a question from Klaas De Vos on uh, green, Sorry, not the green economy, but the blue economy. We hear a lot about investments on land, but what about investments in oceans? And I know that, uh, Philippe, you've got some experience of that through Mirova in trying to get money to move into the ocean sphere with uh, a sustainable ocean fund uh, and something like that. Can you tell us, uh, you know, and your favorite case study, but how do we get more money moving into the blue economy? Yeah, sure. So we, uh, we, we launched the sustainable ocean fund uh, Last year, so uh, we now manage about 130 million US dollars on uh, on this fund, and we uh, invest in very different kind of uh, uh, of businesses. Uh, of course, uh, sustainable fisheries is a basic one, uh, and especially uh, uh, we are, are focusing uh, on uh, a geographical area, which is the Caribbean, uh, and uh, and then we also have uh, very interesting investments in uh, in technology, in some technology which helps to. Uh, uh, to catch uh, the, the the fish you want to catch and uh, and to avoid the uh, side fish side, side uh, uh, fishing, uh, we uh, we have invested also in uh, in uh, businesses around uh, uh, recycling of, of plastics in, uh, in in the oceans and uh, and also uh, uh, um, 
yeah, um, so uh, new food for, 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 for fisheries as well. So there are a lot of new technologies and new entrepreneurs on, on, on this side as well. Um, there, there is also a, a big issue on, uh, about conservation of uh, uh, coastal areas and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and there are certainly a lot of very interesting investments to make in, uh, in ecotourism. Uh, even if, of, of course, the, the COVID crisis make it uh, more difficult than that, that it uh, will be uh, uh, with, without this crisis. So, um, uh, yeah, clearly, uh, uh, blue economy uh, and, and, uh, uh, and sustainable agriculture are both uh, as well interesting. Uh, let's, let's just have a final round now because time is we're running out of time. But let's just have a look. You know, you're all experts in your field. We've talked a bit about blended finance. You know, if you had a magic wand, what would be the real catalyst that's needed? We heard earlier how long it takes sometimes to get money out of, say, the Green Climate Fund or UN, maybe even the World Bank. And the UN system is is extremely complicated and bureaucratic, often for good reasons, because there have been problems in the past with money not ending up in the right place. So given we've got this uncomfortable marriage between the private sector that likes to move fast and loose and the public sector that wants to be slow and careful, this is a difficult marriage. How can we accelerate the movement of money to bring these two worlds together and create a giant blended finance fund that could really catalyze action on the ground but not taking two years to make a decision so philippe a quick quick thought from you quick thoughts and we'll go right around everyone i think we, we need a, a kind of a, a standout of uh, um uh, involvement of, of of public entities i mean uh, we uh we we, we should not have to to uh, to make 10 or 15 different files to get money from uh, all the different uh, MDBs uh, uh, in, in the world and uh, all different governments. So uh, uh, it's a question of really standardize, standardizing the, 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 the relationship between public and private. So I don't know who could uh, take care of this, but uh, yeah, that's clearly uh, uh, a good question. And uh, thank you, John. Welcome back to the platform. I'm going to give the last word to you. We're just doing a quick round, so think of what your favorite catalyst would be. So, uh, Fiona. What's your view on the World Bank? So in terms of catalyst, I actually think also the, 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 the debt market and the, the bond markets are going to be incredibly important to really get scale and to really really scale up. So we've had a, the, the, the green bonds, John, you mentioned the green bond market, but I also think these um, performance linked bonds, I'm actually very excited about them. I think they, and in the book, actually, you have those as the potential instrument for the most leverage, and I completely agree. If we can start to get, not just from the use of proceeds, but actually moving, changing the cost of capital based on results and actually pushing for the financing of actual results, I think that could be incredibly powerful. We're starting to see it in the corporate bond market. We're looking to see how could you do sovereign bonds, link to um, MBTAPs or NDCs, where you actually have some financing that pays for this performance. I think that could be actually really catalytical and it could be a new way of marrying private and public money. So you have an instrument that the private sector knows is, is, is fungible in the market. The, the, pub, the um, concessional finance could help to pay for those results. That I think could be a game changer and really catalytic. Excellent, thank you Fiona. Marissa, uh, what, what would be your favorite catalyst? Well, I, I will actually uh, reference a project that we're actually working on right now, um, which uh, is the infamous rhino bond, which is complicated. Animal conservation and preservation is really, really hard. But historical models haven't necessarily worked because they're often based on uh, gala fundraising at a moment in time. Um, instead of stepping back and taking a holistic look at what animal conservation requires from community engagement to education to anti-poaching to natural ecosystems for the animals and so on. Um, but in this particular project, it's been, a, a, it's been hard and complicated and long, but we've had mission-driven partners like uh, the World Bank working with us, uh, the Jeff, ZSL, and, and philanthropists, all in the same structure saying, you know, there, this is a, a common mission. We each bring different skill sets to the table and different um, capabilities, and we're willing to roll up our sleeves and work together. So I think, in short, it would be the giving ourselves the freedom to experiment on difficult subjects and really take the time, because if you can crack the code on one, then you can replicate it many times over and scale it. 
Uh, I, I can't let you go because uh, about I want to talk about Beyond Meats, which I know you helped to bring to market. And I went in a Dunkin' Donuts in New York when we could still travel and came out with a Beyond Meats burger. Do you think these kinds of new foods are going to be good for nature? Because, of course, the ingredient in a Beyond Meats burger is soya. And there are problems with the supply chain for soya as well. How do you fix that? Yeah, you've got to reconcile it. And I think you need to be judicious and look very carefully at the ingredients and where the food comes from. But if you also step back and look at these plant-based alternatives, what they're arguing is relative to their alternatives. So a plant-based burger versus a beef burger uses substantially less water, substantially less land degradation. You don't have the methane uh, from the animals uh, moving into the atmosphere and so on. So on a relative basis, I think you can uh, be comfortable that it's environmentally sound, but that does not say that the input, the supply chain, uh, isn't always uh, necessarily uh, farm sustainably. So monocrops, we need to make sure that if the input is soy or corn or what have you, that we're thinking about sustainable and regenerative agriculture. But I would also point to really quickly a breakthrough that I think will become commercial probably sometime within the next year or so, and that's cultivated meat and seafood from stem cells of animals and fish. That is profound uh, in that it doesn't use land, uh, it doesn't need much of any water, there are no hormones or antibiotics because it's grown in a lab that is as clean as a pharmaceutical lab versus say maybe food processing plant. Um, and, and just in terms of its potential uh, for helping this very challenged planet, it's pretty exciting stuff. So that's a new breakthrough that I would keep an eye on as, as we move forward. Well, we're all going to watch as the emphasis moves from fossil fuels to the global food system and how it's got to adapt to stop being the bogeyman of nature like fossil fuels are the bogeyman of climate. How do we come up with these new foods? Fascinating to hear new technologies, but will they be good for nature? Uh, Daniela, what about you? A quick word, only a few words, if you will, on your favorite catalyst. And then I'm going to go to John for the last word and then hand over to Gilles. Thank you so much. I think that we have to start uh, talking about this kind of investments out of the environmental sector. We have to disseminate these case studies and these uh, successful uh, case investments, uh, but with the investors, with the people that is interested in know and in understand and, and know how they can be involved in this kind of investments. So I think uh, that uh, talk about it out of the environmental sector is a very good step. Mm. Thank you, Daniela. So, John, you get the last word. You've done a wonderful job, and thank you again for being the chief editor on this great project. But you've seen all the catalysts and all the money, and you've worked on a lot of other things. What is your favorite catalyst? Such a difficult question. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Uh, I'm involved in some of these catalysts out there. Uh, uh, I'll mention in passing the Coalition for Private Investment and Conservation, for example. But I have to say that if I were to pick one that has the most potential, I would go back to what I was saying at the end of my presentation. And that is uh, um, a number of pilots amount to nothing more than a number of pilots. So uh, it, I think this creates an opportunity for a country, uh, a financial center to say, we are going to build the ecosystem that otherwise could take decades to develop and uh, uh, support it with the kind of know-how that is needed, uh, facilitate the establishment of the service providers uh, that are going to provide the resources and the knowledge for the development of the field. And crucially, from the point of view of the, of the government, the right framework that addresses such, such difficult questions uh, that we're having to deal with right now uh, in particularly in countries like the US, such as the fact that there are laws that discourage ESG investments and that discourage any consideration of non-financial impacts or benefits uh, in the decision-making of professionals. And until we tackle this holistically, uh, it's going to be difficult. It can happen, but that would be the most powerful way. Well, everyone, there you have it. You've heard uh, almost an hour and a half of our struggle to find solutions. And the world needs them. We haven't found them all yet. 
Uh, but now I find, having spent 40 years at the front line of this, the mood music is much better than it was. And Gilles, it was probably much better than it was 10 years ago when we launched the first uh, little pink book. Now we've got the 10th anniversary edition. So thank you for giving this platform. Thank you to AFD. Thank you to all those who contributed to it and all the sponsors. And I'm handing over to you, Gilles, to make the final remarks. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, all panelists. Uh, thank you, John. This has really been fascinating. Such a rich uh, debate, uh, both uh, uh, both uh, uh, encompassing all the scope of the little uh, book on investing in nature and getting into the nitty gritties of, of uh, some key uh, uh, analysis, hypothesis, and, and solutions, and those updated figures that are so important because getting global financial data on on the on biodiversity finance is 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 difficult and it is uh, such a, a precious uh, result of uh, the the collective uh, work uh, uh, around global canopy and and on this book um i won't try to summarize what was said but i mean in a nutshell uh, for the non specialists uh, among our audience but there are many specialists i guess i mean to fill the gap we need to increase the existing positive by two or three. We need to mobilize private finance to change the proportion with public efforts. Um, but all this will only have an impact if we realign negative incentives, such as those for fossil fuels, intensive agriculture and fish, and create an enabling ecosystem, including better metrics, better disclosure, regulation or encouragement, uh, and as well um, a, a sort of a regulatory environment that uh, encourages corporates and finance uh, to actually perform on, on non-financial issues. All this with better delivery, better coordination, better coherence, especially at national, international uh, uh, levels. Um, and as, as a, you know, working within a public uh, finance institution. I think the nitty gritties of, of blended finance um, uh, or, or with impact on biodiversity between the public and the private sector are a key bottleneck at the moment that we really need to widen and to look into. And as Philippe was saying, I think it is absolutely key that we, 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 we facilitate on both sides uh, this uh, this interface and the possibility to to go at scale on blended finance. So such uh, rich and coherent uh, propositions all together with an array of complementary solution um, and and all this showing, which I think is one of the key conclusion of your work, that it is possible to bridge the gap, which is indeed good news. Uh, and thank you all as well for uh, to the participants for your exchanges and contributions, very rich to the point. Um, and I think that makes me think that actually we are at a time on, on, on biodiversity uh, finance that might you know, encourage us to really invest whatever platforms exist to share Q&A on biodiversity finance, bringing together you know, finance people, regulators, conservation communities to actually move on implementing the recommendations uh, and insights of, um, of the, the little book on, on biodiversity finance, an idea to think about anyway. Before closing, I just wish to add one more thing. Knowledge, figures, analysis, and sound information is always you know, a key starting point, but it is not enough for the rapid, the rapid sorry, changes that we need. And I think we really need to take this book and go and change minds and conceptions and perceptions around us. We need to really take the uh, little book to make sure that biodiversity becomes embedded in economics and finance and the activities and mindsets of bankers, of asset managers, of corporates, of public budgets and ministers of finance. And I think we need to approach really through our networks, whether it's at the CBD secretariat, those involved in impact finance beyond biodiversity, the network of 450 uh, uh, public development banks, the network of central banks, the GEF and all its networks, 
the G20, the G277, uh, all need to be proactively engaged with the little books, uh, figures, and mindset. And I think we really need to do this outreach. The, the little book on investing in nature really needs to be our Bible until sub 15. And I, I would like to encourage each of us today, we are more than 500 on, on, online together, to really um, pledge that before COP15, we each of us go and convince maybe at least 10 persons around us, especially in the finance world, and especially people that know nothing of biodiversity, and convince them about the positive and realistic options that are included in the little uh, book that we launched uh, today. So that everybody understand that investing in nature, converting our economy into a nature positive economy and finance to reverse the dramatic loss in biodiversity and, and to reconcile humanity and our economy with our, our planet is possible. So I think this is really, uh, really an important task and I pledge I, I beg you to go and, and do this uh, advocacy as much as possible in, in the circles that are not yet uh, convinced or informed about, uh, about this. Uh, you can see on the slide uh, the site where you can download uh, the uh, copy of, uh, of the little book, so do uh, use it uh, freely. So thank you again to all. Thank you, Andrew and John. Thank you to all the panelists for this very rich discussion around the launch of the little book and long live the little pink book in its new uh, version. And I am sure it will be tremendously impactful and useful uh, for uh, the year 2021 and its biodiversity global agenda. Thank you again and see you soon. Thank you.